Hello fellow classmates, my name is Lisa, and today I will be discussing a very prevalent motif in Hitchcock's films, namely his usage of windows and curtains. Topics like perspective and the lenses in which we all view the world through came up nearly every day in class this summer. Our life experiences and backgrounds stick to our personal lenses, quite like colored filters on a camera lens, and as such, no two people view the world or experience films in the exact same way. For example, my personal history in the theater and as a writer has conditioned me to constantly be on the prowl for metaphors when I'm experiencing media. So, my take on windows and curtains in Hitchcock is metaphorical in nature. This video will examine two films, Rear Window and Torn Curtain, and the various statements that Hitchcock makes with this motif. Although this motif is multivalent in nature, my thesis is that windows stand for clarity and understanding. I will argue in favor of the theatrical functions of windows and curtains, and discuss the ways in which windows serve as motivators for Hitchcock's characters, while curtains serve as obstructions or roadblocks to them. So without any further ado, this is the poetry of windows and curtains in Hitchcock. Since we did not watch this film in class, I will go ahead and briefly synopsize the first half an hour or so of Torn Curtain as I go through the following examples, and I will also try to keep things as spoiler-free as possible. The plot of Torn Curtain focuses on engaged couple Michael Armstrong and Sarah Sherman. At the beginning we see Michael, who is a rocket scientist, and his fiance Sarah on a cruise to Copenhagen where he is to attend a conference. Everything seems good and romantic on the surface, and then Hitchcock embeds some lies and deception into the story. In support of my thesis, let's think of curtains as metaphors and hone in on Michael and Sarah's relationship. To make this easier, I've categorized curtains into two sections, concealers and revealers. Yes, I really did just do that. When we talk about lies and deception, those metaphorical curtains serve as concealers. Okay, I'll stop. Characters and circumstances alike manipulate those curtains. Sometimes they shut tighter, sometimes a formidable breeze blows through them and enlightenment peeks through the edges. Sometimes they are merely opened and yes, sometimes they are torn. The inciting incident of the story is when a mysterious radiogram is delivered to their bedroom aboard the cruise ship. Michael feigns disinterest in it for Sarah's sake but later responds to it when he's alone. The phone rings when they arrive at the hotel and Sarah answers. It is in regards to the radiogram, but Michael lies about it to Sarah from behind a transparent shower curtain. The visibility of the curtain and its transparency clues the audience into his lie and Sarah's ability to see through it. Of course this motif appears again. Of course. This time it is in the form of an ornate framing of white curtains. In presentation, the curtains look like they belong in a theater, and rightfully so. They are incorporated to enforce the fact that Michael is merely playing a part. Another consideration, of course, deals with the poetry of politics. Torn Curtain premiered in 1966. With the Cold War still raging, Hitchcock used this film to capture the tumultuous political climate of the time. The Iron Curtain, a term heard throughout the film, refers to the literal and metaphorical borders between the Soviet Union and the rest of Europe. When Sarah finally deciphers Michael's behavior, she learns that he has cancelled his original project and is heading to East Berlin, which is behind the Iron Curtain. Confused by this discovery, she lies about returning home and follows him onto the plane. In this highly poetic shot, we see the Iron Curtain represented by the cabin door that opens when Michael and Sarah, who followed him on board, land in East Berlin. She remains at the door and watches in disbelief as her fiancé is welcomed by the East German government and defects. Even more visually stunning is the shot of Sarah's descent from the curtain that is the cabin door. She appears in this moment to be a reluctant performer, condemned, as she walks to play the role of supporter to her fiancé, who she does not agree with at this time. After a period of trial and error, Sarah still cannot make sense of Michael's defection. And yet again, Hitchcock uses curtains to get his idea across to the audience. As Michael enters Sarah's hotel room, we see that she is standing in front of an open window and looking out. However, she hasn't bothered to remove all of the obstructions from her view. A white curtain remains, depriving Sarah of a complete picture of the world around her. This image suggests that she is not entirely in the know about Michael's loyalty to his country or his identity as a double agent.
Although windows are a driving force in the drama of Rear Window, curtains also serve a very important function in this film. Their appearances in the opening and closing credits aside, Hitchcock uses the blinds in the apartment of Mr. and Mrs. Thorwald along with her scream to show the audience that something is very, very wrong. As we discussed in class, we already know that the neighbors keep their windows open at all times, not only for Jeff's indulgences, but to combat the sweltering summer heat. Some of the characters remove their mattresses entirely and camp out on their fire escapes at night. It is therefore extremely unusual that the blinds and curtains should be closed on the night of Mrs. Thorwald's murder. The closed blinds seem to underscore Mr. Thorwald's suspicious behavior. For some time thereafter, Mrs. Thorwald's blinds remain shut. This symbolizes the mystery of her scream and the suspicion of Mr. Thorwald that is harbored by Jeffries. When the blinds and windows are finally opened, they reveal her rolled up mattress and a trunk being packed by Mr. Thorwald. Whatever the case may be, the audience knows that she will not be returning to that room. Many apartment buildings today have uniform curtains in their windows, but the curtains and rear window are different. Furthermore, they almost seem to mirror the personalities of their owners, and clue the audience in on what kind of performances take place behind them. For example, you have the billowing white edges of Mrs. Lonely Heart's curtains, the dark waves of fabric above the composer's studio apartment could easily belong in any concert hall, and the sharp, knife-like blinds that mask the sinister activities that take place in the Thorwell's apartment. This idea repeats itself when Miss Lonely Heart has a confrontation with a suitor who she isn't particularly pleased with. This photo's chapter that can be found on page 213 of The Art of Alfred Hitchcock draws a stunning parallel between the theatricality of Lisa and Miss Lonely Hearts. Lisa is a very theatrical individual, and her interactions with Jeff and her surroundings only emphasize this. She switches the lights on at the beginning of each of her scenes. She also interacts with the curtains in Jeff's apartment. Finally fed up with Jeff's seemingly unending disinterest in her, Lisa decides to create a barrier between Jeff and his distraction. The scene is ridiculously fun to study. What Lisa is trying to do here is to shorten the stage so that she might be the only spectacle that Jeff needs. Her dialogue, which I will discuss in depth shortly, is rich with theatrical references. It ties the scene together and makes the drawing of those curtains the ultimate assault on Jeff's newfound passion. Stammen Pearson's essay speaks to the theatricality of this piece. On page 195 of A Hitchcock Reader, they write, and I quote, The very language of Rear Window resonates with the terminology of entertainment. Lisa speaks of the opening night of Jeff's final week in cast. Pulling the drape, she tells Jeff that the show is over and promises coming attractions. Up, there is one more sibling of windows that I'd like to discuss. When my family first moved to Washington from California, we rented a house on Orcas Island. It was culture shock to me because I went from living in the overly populated Bay Area to living in the middle of the woods on an island. The house, which was more like a cabin really, had these huge windows with thick wooden frames in almost every room. And you'd look through them and you'd see nothing but nature for miles and miles. Everyone in my family is an artist, at least in some sense of the word, but we all agreed that the house didn't need any art on the walls, and it was because of those windows. They were the frames, and the views that they provided was the art. The placement of art is huge in Hitchcock's films, and I'm almost certain that he had a similar idea in regards to their relationship with windows. We already know that the frames on Jeff's wall are occupied with his own photos, save for one. An impressionist painting hangs conspicuously above his fireplace. For those who don't know too much about art, a simplified definition of Impressionism is a real scene fused with the imagination of the artist. In other words, the very definition of perspective and all of its glorious deviations. Portraiture, as I'm sure you already know, is relentless in Hitchcock's films. Just think back to all of those portraits in Vertigo. During a very tense scene in Torn Curtain, Michael senses that he is being trailed through the Berlin Museum. Not only do the trailing footfalls urge him to escape, but the watchful pictures that line the walls seem to as well. He is in this moment being watched through a hundred tiny windows and it is chilling for audience and character alike. In conclusion, I hope that this video helped you look at windows and curtains in Hitchcock in a new light. Thank you so much for watching guys, I'll see you at Q&A.